Hi, Media Techies. So first of all, thank you to all of you who've checked out part one of us covering our Flagman's death. We're so happy to geek out over pirates with you all. And if you're interested in sharing your opinion of our pod with us, it would really help us out if you could rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. We'll read five star reviews out on the show. We are now in part two, where we discuss monstrosity, trauma, Lucius and Black Pete, the Bonnet family dynamics, and much more. So without further ado, enjoy the episode. talk about monstrosity yeah should we move into that is that okay so this kind of relates to the idea of eccentricity again that we were talking about earlier um but in his seven theses on monstrosity cohen writes that the monster of prohibition exists to demarcate the bounds that hold together that system of relations we call culture to call horrid attention to the borders that cannot must not be crossed so i think this is quite a basic thing about monstrosity it's like that idea of like you know we paint something as monstrous to be like you can't be that or like that's like outside of like the realm of possibility but like interestingly once you kind of create that thing and especially with monsters like they are made to be seen as spectacles so once you kind of create this thing you then sort of show that something else is possible and it's sort of like kind of creates it it simultaneously kind of like shows like the boundaries between the normal and the non-normal but also exposes the fragility of like the difference between those two things And yeah, so like the um, concept of monstrosity has been like reclaimed in various ways by like various different groups. But at the same time, people have like kind of brought up the fact that um, the monster is also like uh, bound up with like colonial and like racist um, histories and discourses. And so like if you're going to reclaim the monstrous, you need to be aware of sort of like what those discourses do. And like the racist trope of like imagining blackness as the unmarked and unacknowledged condition on which the existence of whiteness depends. Um, that's Susan Stryker wrote about that in relation to trans monstrosity and this kind of like notion of like reclaiming the monstrous for trans people and also the idea of like uh, the monstrous kind of sometimes reinscribing the abnormality of the racialized body um, and colonization is the process of rendering racialized bodies monstrous and I think you also kind of see like you have like the monstrous in the show and kind of like an intersection between like queerness and race as well um, and I think you kind of see how Ed struggle like Ed struggles with being cast as monstrous for being this sort of like super but also non-human blackbeard and how that's kind of like racialized and like dehumanizing and this kind of like idea of like is he wanting him to be barbaric and it's sort of like this monstrosity that's sort of bound up with queerness but also with like his identity as like a maori man as well because is he sort of like calling him to sort of be his true self and like that in and of itself is the racist behind it right because it's yeah. like no 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 this is your true nature and you're like no it isn't it's your racist understanding of his true nature it's not real but it's interesting what you said about the boundary is like that they have to be so strict because it reminds me just so much about the way that we talk right now about like trans identities mm. because if this was so deeply biological this gender you keep referring to this gender binary why do you keep needing to like reinforce it so much with so much punishment and discrimination and abuse if it was like truly so like natural for us to exist within these like two strict cisnormative gender binaries then you wouldn't have to enforce it so much literally yeah and it's sort of like the monster is like all about that kind of like you know you cannot like cross into this thing another quote this is from um graham i'll link this as well um, while they make like horror they are not strictly speaking this is monsters representations of abjection for the abject is repressed hidden and submerged Whereas one of the functions of monsters is to be a spectacle of abnormality. Monsters are excluded and demonized, but nonetheless functionally necessary to the systems that engender and classify them. And so that's like, again- You need the fear, right? Yeah, yeah. Being able to like define what's normal, you need to have what's not normal. And so like, in order to do that, you've got to point at the thing that's not normal. When I was a kid, I sort of, I remember like having a weird conversation with my parents because someone was like on television arguing about how this like gay space was like, really feminine or something and I was like but there's only men in there because I was a child and I didn't understand it it's sort of like the boundaries of the other need to exist in order to sort of create like you need like an opposite gender Mm. to sort of define masculinity because why Mm. else like why would like gay men in a space with like only other gay men not be sort of the most masculine thing it's Mm. because masculinity as in and of itself defines itself over the other as well and like you need the monsters to sort of keep the fear of like it's the same thing again that sort of links to colonialism and all that you need to create a fear of the barbaric of the uncivilized world to make people think that the rules in the civilized world are worth it right yeah 
exactly yeah. i wanted to jump into um this idea of like the image of like the monstrous as like the kind of flip side like we were just saying of the normative and like heteronormativity in the nuclear family and i wanted to bring up steed and mary's relationship and kind of how their like relationship is also like this kind of image it's like when they're first introduced to each other it's like whilst their portrait is being painted so it's like immediately it's like they are just about like this image of this sort of heteronormative couple and then when the badminton twin goes to kill steed the second time around he says that like steed destroys anything beautiful um and he he wait, hold on, where's the full quote but he refers to steed as a monster i see I yeah know that. that's so interesting have you found it i have i found it so um the twin says that um steve bonnet is not a human being he's a monster he defiles beautiful things are they it's... beautiful though bad exactly are they beautiful <laughs> exactly and it's like and his like two examples or like his main examples are like the nuclear family that like steve destroy like destroys and then this like great blackbeard pirate that he also destroys and and it's sort of like presenting it as these terrible and like monstrous things to do but then the show shows us that like these things again were never beautiful to begin with and actually by destroying them he's like made them better like I don't know sorry yeah, yeah. I yeah. think it's and so he good goes back home and then they're like we were having ball fun without you go away <laughs> yeah. like, you know, why? <laughs> I think yeah. it's also like badminton's like real like frustration when he wants to arrest and kill both Ed and Steed mm -hmm. and by acting calling an act of grace it doesn't work because you need the monster to remain a monster so you need to be able to kill the monster yeah like, the monsters joining the British Navy is not as good of like a monster image yeah. you can use for yourself as think, yeah um, it's just not as useful as an image to like create fear within the people who live in the civilized part of the world and it shows how like fluid those boundaries are as well yeah you can just so if you can collapse it back in that way i know it kind of yeah it kind of undercuts this idea that they're just like pure monsters if you can like and yeah, like you were saying and then also undercuts the idea that like the empire is like completely separate to them as well even if it's supposed to be like a power move it's sort of like yeah, kind yeah, of. Like now you're part of the empire. Those people who you thought were so, by your own logic, now there are monsters in the empire. Yeah, <laughs> folding laundry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's okay. Sorry, that would be less so hard. <laughs> This would have put like Sorry. it worked better in like the performativity part, but I forgot the chef, the accountant, and like that sounds fancy as fuck. And this whole idea <laughs> of like Ed's understanding of aristocracy is also so deeply connected to like performativity. Yes, and then it's sort of again un undoing that picture of what the aristocracy is because I've got like yeah. the two French, like the husband and wife. They're not also French. Simple. Are they not French? No, 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 no. some Prussian. of them aren't French. Oh shit, they're Prussian. Ah, <laughs> well, no, but it's like her family's Prussian. But are they it's still so Prussian? It's so funny to me I'm because sorry. there were multiple moments where someone says something German, like "Was ist los?" with like the worst accent I've ever heard, and then the subtitle <laughs> said speaks French, French. <laughs> yeah. and, I just, and I just sat there and I was oh, like that's not French <laughs> that makes sense though because I was like they sound French but then they're speaking German what could this mean and she actually says that she's Prussian in the, yeah okay yeah, sorry she, the Prussian you're right though she does say it like it's her like the, like she her family or her like family I don't family remember what, what she yeah, is her family is Prussian and I will say though like because um I mean, I don't know if this was the time when this was happening, but like, I mean, this was always happening, but like European aristocracy, like married each other so much. They must all be like French, English, German, Prussian, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So it might still be very well that you're right. Sorry for like yelling at <laughs> no, you that's for okay. saying no, that no. they're not French. <laughs> Played brilliantly by our beloved, oh, I'm yeah. just claiming her to be our beloved, Kristen Shaw, who is Lucy, uh, Louise, Jesus Christ, <laughs> <laughs> Louise in Bob's Burgers, and I love her so much, but yeah, she's so good in this. <laughs> so good. <laughs> With the most giant wig you've ever seen. <laughs> But it's also denaturalizing this idea of heteronormativity in that instance with them being siblings. Yeah. And it's sort of, it's satire, but also you're like, well, obviously these people did intermarry within families as well. So it's yeah. sort of, you're breaking down that image of heteronormativity as a natural, just like, normal thing. This is the beauty that badminton is saying is yeah. destroying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he literally does because he just burns down this ship. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
and breaking down this idea of classiness of the aristocracy when actually it's sort of they're just really bitchy and then they sort of end up fighting each other and stuff at the very end um, of that episode. They're the people with yeah. the most money and with the least understanding of how to use it, how to not get fucked over. Yeah, they're the real monsters. Yeah. <laughs> like tied <it> back yeah. <laughs> to a point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to talk a bit about the Kraken maybe as well? And so, I don't know whether this show kind of talks about them. I'm not sure whether this show is about reclaiming the monster, or about questioning the idea of monstrosity more, being like, is this actually monstrous? Who are the real monsters? More about the nuance yeah. of never just being one thing. Lucy said this this idea of the show is being eccentric. It's not gonna traumatize you or something. It's gonna be a fun comedy. The show I feel like is more about someone like Ed, capable of really horrible violence. He killed his father, he feeds Izzy his own toe, he Burns that ship of people that one time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Love a good meme. Yeah. <laughs> meme is different. <laughs> He doesn't want to kill someone one-on-one, jumping on a ship and having his crew attack everyone in the background for him, or setting a ship on fire that has people in it. But this one-on-one killing thing seems to be something that really bothers him. But the show overall, I feel like it's less about the idea of these are the monsters. Again, the monster is the structure. The monster is civilization Mm. because that's badminton's job right like it's not about the fact that people do the wrong make the wrong choices within a system it's just the system in and of itself is violent Mm -hmm. and pirates are just the ones that are sort of i guess less hypocritically living within the system i guess the show is less about this idea of men are monsters but more about people are capable of a lot of things people are capable of cutting off fingers and then also just being in love and Mm -hmm. throwing yeah and, and the monstrosity is like the toxic masculinity pulling him back. But I don't know that it's yeah. like masculinity. It feels like more like racist masculinity by yeah. Izzy and being hurt. If you're in the wrong state of mind, that shit can create a lot of violence. Yeah. And then you throw Lucius overboard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm sure Lucius will forgive him when he definitely returns next year. Yes. I mean, I'm like, maybe he shouldn't. He's doing but he a Billy Bones. Up He's, yeah. He's doing a Billy Bones. He's going to wash up on an island. We don't see <laughs> him gonna... die. And so that's, if, when you don't see a character literally die, it means yeah. they're not dead in a show. That's how shows work. Again, trips yeah. or yeah. filming. Yeah, he's just going to like wash up on the island along with Steve and Yeah. And he'll just be like, you'll like, never guess what's happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And least you're he, watching yeah. David Jenkins. Do not fuck with me. Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm going to be very angry on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to mention the fact that like rewatching it, you realize that there's like this kind of running theme of Lucius almost being killed slash being thrown overboard. But then it's sort of like a lot of foreshadowing that goes into it. And also like when his finger gets chopped off, that gets thrown overboard. And it's like, we're committing <laughs> oh. his finger to the scene. And I'm like, no. <laughs> because it's Jim, I think also wants to throw him overboard. And, and you sort of see yes. Jim like dragging Lucius's body and you're like, oh shit, he's dead. And then he's not dead. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm like, why is it always Lucius? Is it because he's the only competent one? So it's he's the one that kind of, yeah. Because yeah. then it's like, oh, they can't get into high drinks if Lucius is around being like, what are you doing? So he should be like, <laughs> yeah, that's somewhere. true. <laughs> like, for like narrative purposes, he's got to just be <laughs> off somewhere else. <laughs> When I watched that scene where Lucius is giving Black Pete head in the, I keep calling it a kitchen. I'm not sure that it was a story. They're somewhere and like they get up and you're like, yeah. that was also one of those scenes when I watched again as a queer viewer being like, really? <laughs> I was just so shocked because it just wasn't this thing of like, we're going to put a queer scene here now. Like, you know what I mean? It was yeah. just like part of the story. That was more about the fact that they start to get closer, but also about the fact that they have no privacy. Yeah. <laughs> We John is just sleeping next to yeah. them. <laughs> and also Izzy being just being a nosy asshole just needs to control everybody. And we cannot just not mention the line. Actually, I think I'm just so-so, but I've decided to carry myself like I'm cute because that's just so funny. <laughs> the actor and also the actor who plays We John, they did get Instagram live. Yeah. And they talked about the fact that Con O'Neill, the actor who plays Izzy, where he says like, daddy. <laughs> And like apparently yeah. that went on for a while while they were filming it, but they just had to cut most of it. Oh uh, yeah, I always skip that. But imagine like five minutes of that. Uh. <laughs> It's like an episode that's 30 minutes long where five minutes of that scene. That's like <laughs> a high percentage. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> 
just acknowledging and then also not acknowledging history or just cultures is when Lucius walks in on Olo and Jim having sex and then one of them just screams like put a sock on the door and Lucius like I don't know what that means <laughs> yeah and he's like eating at the same time he like, doesn't <laughs> stop eating he's still chewing and I don't know what that means and then he's like we're doing something on deck it's like get out yeah <laughs> Lucius was the character because again the show starts with a writing on black screen oh this is like a joke on black sales and then when Lucius showed up as a character I was like oh this is a comedy version of the bookkeeper guy and I was sort of rolling my eyes at that and I was like this is going to be annoying and then like Lucius ended up being just one of the best characters yeah. on the show <laughs> Jim wants to kill Lucius quite a lot of the show and then ends up also kissing Lucius because he brings back the the dagger. dagger. Mm. Yeah, the dagger. Yeah. Yeah. And then Lucius is going like, wouldn't it be so funny was if I was just into Jim now? <laughs> <laughs> Why do his kids hate him so much? He did play with them and stuff. I just don't understand why. Okay, I think two things. I think partly it's probably not the most fun thing in the world for your dad to run away in the middle of the night and not say goodbye. They hated him so... before he ran away. Did they? No, they didn't. Yes, did they? they were talking about pigs and horses at the table and his kids they... looked at him. Huh? What's wrong I, with you? I, I feel like they were following their cues, that cue from their mum. I think it was because Mary was just sort of <laughs> being kind of frosty. <laughs> well, we're sat over here with mum, so we're just going to like, you know, when you're in that, you're like, uh, ah, yeah. and so it's just like, I'm just going to kind of follow this cue and then kind of carry on talking with mum because she seems to know what she's talking about. That shot felt like it was like shot from Steve's perspective, looking down the table as well. So this kind of feels yeah. like, how he sees his family as viewing him because like mm. he doesn't feel like because it's so does. removed so it, it might be that they yeah. they were like yeah you i like you 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 my dad we have a nice play but <laughs> kind of in his perspective it is that feeling out of place yeah also and then when he comes back they're like well mum was like much happier with you gone yeah and so there's also <laughs> Who are yeah. you? <laughs> and then also like, yeah, you did. You you left us at the middle of the night without saying goodbye. That's yeah. really sad. <laughs> With your toy ship, you didn't even leave the yeah. toy behind. <laughs> yeah. And he also like leaves a candle on. I'm like, that's a little bit dangerous. Maybe blow the candle on. <laughs> Steed and fire don't mix terribly well. He doesn't have a very good fire safety yeah. like Yeah, he um... never had fire safety then. <laughs> no, stop. His dad was never like Steed is what he <laughs> do with fire. There's the argument that whenever Steed wears blue, that he's pretending because he's trying to be a tough pirate captain in the first episode when he wears the teal. He wears blue in when they have the painting mm. like done and he's pretending to be happy in the marriage when he's trying to be a father, when he's trying to be tough for his crew. He wears blue to, as his like stage persona and then when he's real in himself he wears more the yellow and the red oh that's really interesting in terms of costume and like theatricality and yeah, like performance yeah. as well i hadn't even thought of that and so all these different changes of clothes when blackbeard and steed change clothes as well and the yeah. performance and costume mm. ah <laughs> oh well it's like when they go for the treasure map he fully just cosplays as like an explorer he's like yeah. Yeah, like exploring <laughs> outfit and you're like what is this <laughs> I just thought it was funny again we talked about this before but the idea of what image what is real and what is not mm. when they get painted yes the hand of the mother is on the head of the boy but then when you look next to them with the real image the boy is laying on the ground because he's so sick of sitting in like this one <laughs> position for like this painting <laughs> so he just I'm not doing this and so even that is like a fake image of heteronormativity because kids don't want to sit still for hours for a fucking painting yeah <laughs> Also, I love that wedding gifts were tombstones. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You marry and then you die. Then you die. <laughs> it's like this is the next step on the way to death. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just love they didn't do the jealous heterosexual wife who's just annoyed. And they didn't just over correct. They didn't just, she's still pissed at him and rightfully so. Yeah. And sometimes to murder him with a skewer and he's like well I kind of deserved it and <laughs> yeah and it's like watching it you're like yeah good for you yeah <laughs> for it. Honestly. I can't be angry at you no. in German when you say something is zum kotzen meaning it's to throw up meaning it sucks and it's just quite a common metaphor we use in everyday speech it rains and I wanted to do something to dance like zum kotzen and I just love the fact that when he shows up Mary throws up <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's her commentary on just, <laughs> no you were supposed to be dead I had you legally declared dead yeah uh...
In the scene where Mary tries to, you were gonna stab me in the ear hole. <laughs> <Let's do it. laughs> she still says that she's sorry for Doug. Why? For the first no. time in your life, you were having good sex that you actually enjoyed with a man you like and that appreciates you and yeah. encourages you. You found your just... himbo, like <laughs> <laughs> you did it. What's the other widow called that I can't remember. Born in red. The um I eye patch. Arranged if you if you want, you know, if you just you know murder's a natural cause. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is. <laughs> in a lot of shows, again, the stuff that I watched growing up early 2000s, this woman who hates men was always the butt of the joke. Mm, like this woman yeah. who was happy to be without a dude just did not exist. And in this show, there was an entire episode almost dedicated like, <laughs> to the just women being like, it's so nice that he's gone. <laughs> They weren't shown as desperate or pathetic. They're just so happy <laughs> that these two dudes are just gone. The only um, um, sustainable model, model of uh, heteronormativity <laughs> in the show is the seagulls. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> and it's a tragedy. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Paul and Olivia. R.I.P. R.I.P. Steve's relationship but also kind of more broadly the crew's relationships with each other and sort of just like there's a maturing throughout the show of from, away from this like more kind of toxically masculine pirate image towards more of a vulnerability which then gets kind of destroyed towards the end that's kind of the progression of the show that's the kind of maturing these characters do we're in, we're men we don't yeah. sew shit and then he's like no this is still like very manly <laughs> yeah it's like roach sewed up his own shoulder that's, <laughs> that's like, yeah. So I'm just ready again. Check out this fabulous booty I'm hawking. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that was my least favorite joke in the show was the thing of them being mistaken for prostitutes. I just think yeah. that that's so stupid, especially again on a show where the whole point of it is these are people who live outside of the realm of normality, outside of the center. And the sex workers is the thing where you're still making a joke about it. I'm like, ugh. It feels kind of like a joke from like 10 years ago a little bit. Yeah, it did. I feel like, and you also mentioned like the balls jokes as well, like in that episode. I feel like there were just a few, yeah, ones where it was just like, episode two wasn't my favorite. Although there were some no. good moments as well. But yeah. yeah. No, the best just... bit was my noses. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Leslie Jones. <laughs> that was so fucking funny. <laughs> It just that joke about the sex workers just reminded me of Bob's Burgers when Linda talks to her daughter and don't shave above the knee, only strippers shave above the knee. Well, the good ones. Anyway, I get the joke, but it's still like feels a little bit at the expense of that as opposed to what we consider to be respectable or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you don't get any sex worker characters in the show either. Like yes, unlike yes, Black Sails, where I yes. feel like Black Sails do that does that better. I don't know how they're going to, what they're going to do for like season two, whether they're going to like address that, but it's a joke at people's expense and then not actually showing any actual sex workers or like talking about themselves. Well, so again, you're pirates mm -hmm. and the, the, the sex work is the thing that you're like, yeah. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> I yeah it's like that's a bit too far you're like yeah that kind of feels like I literally known as like the oldest profession on the planet I don't know where you get off well this is too far out, outside I wonder of the if realm it's also again kind of a toxic masculinity thing because it's like a kind of misogyny of an emasculating quote unquote yeah. emasculated profession that's kind of where it's starting off and so I'm not saying that makes it okay, like that I'm like no no no, no, no fine but like it's sort of they don't make kind of jokes like that towards the end of the show and I feel like it wouldn't have worked at that point. Because, See, that's why the yeah. balls joke, I felt like a little bit of a subversion because that's Geraldo, mm -hmm. one of uh, Spanish Jackie's husbands, manages to lure them away because he uses this toxic masculinity idea of big balls equating being ma manly to lure them away and then mm. they get attacked and then they get uh, taken by the Spanish. He uses that idea of toxic masculinity. That's why it's just like when he says like, we're not prostitutes, mate. <laughs> That's why I just like that joke. There's no subversion of that. It's just them being annoyed, disgusted at the idea of someone thinking that they're selling a service. And you're like, why? Why do you care? <laughs> they could have done something more interesting with that is what I'm saying. I really like your pet about, uh, your pet, sorry, your, your <laughs> really point like your about, pet. <laughs> like your pet. no, it's your point about pets. 
The love of a pet makes a man weak. That's Ed, I think. Is it Ed or Izzy? I don't remember. No, it's Ed because it's like his... I'm pretty sure it is because it's his rule that they don't have pets yeah. on a ship. Maybe it was Izzy quoting Ed because that's the Maybe. thing. He says, "You, I don't want you to go to doggy heaven because Ed made his crew member <laughs> oh. get rid kill his dog. And they go to different heavens. <laughs> Because he's referring to Ed's love for Bonnet being like a pet. I just think it's interesting in terms of toxic masculinity because, again, something that makes this show better is just the fact that love in heteronormative aspects is a lot about ownership. It's a mm. lot about this uh, because Lucius and Black Peter, like, we don't own each other. The way that um, heteronormativity sees love is like, this is a really hot woman. I now get to own her. But the love of a pet is sort of not about that because. I mean, dogs are, yes, but like uh, cats just don't give a shit, really. Yeah. <laughs> like you just sort of, I love, I love cats. Like when I say this, I say this with love and I would <laughs> love to also have a cat again. Cats just have this beautiful way of just not wanting to be confined to a space. They're just, they're happy to let you feed them. And, you know, you have the honor of feeding them, yeah. but it's really about yeah. them and they're really autonomous in a lot of ways. And it's, it's kind of interesting because it's like linking back to the idea of democracy on pirate ships as well and this idea of a greater level of equality. But I think it's interesting, like Carl the Seagull, how Carl is kind of a member of the crew and sort of, Carl isn't really a pet. Carl is, you know, is he's kind of like, he's free. Yeah, he comes and goes, like, you know, has this sort of like relationship with buttons, but like, isn't his pet. It's like a different like animal human relationship, which I just think is kind of interesting. And is also again, like another kind of subversion of normative relationships and how it would normally be, you know, like you own a pet, or, like buttons doesn't own Carl. Like, like Carl is yeah. an autonomous bird that just sort of exists around buttons. It's again another kind of alternative relationship. That's not yeah. about ownership, and that's not about I get to set the boundaries for you. Like everyone gets to set the boundaries for themselves. This love that Ed has for Steve just is more than heteronormative love because it doesn't exist within these boundaries. He just really likes him, and that's so nice. Yeah. Sorry, I just can't remember what the number was now, but someone on TikTok was like, I looked up how old these birds get. And that's actually possible that Buttons has known Carl for most of his life. Oh, and I was no. like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> like they have a true lifelong commitment to each other. Oh. <laughs> because Calico Jack is an asshole. Again. But then, like, Carl's, is it like Carl's wife comes along? Then yeah. Like, yeah. Wife. <laughs> Olivia, uh, Carl didn't come home last night. <laughs> um. Jack, when he's, I don't even remember how he phrased it now, but the way that he implies that they also had sex with Jack and Ed, it felt to me also like a representation of old school type of, sometimes they would put bisexuality in a side note in shows because they would then be able to cut it out in markets where you're not allowed to be using queerness as a narrative but the way he said it felt to me like this is one of those you can cut out so it felt to me like almost like a comment on like old mm. school type of queer mm. narrative or like queer narrative plot points because the way he says it is it's no big deal it's no big deal it's no big deal and you're like yeah I get it it's no big deal like going you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> like he needs it to be known that he doesn't want to be known as homophobic for apparently yeah. having had something with Ed and you're like yeah I got it the first time <laughs> yeah and I think it also I think it does that and at the same time it does it's like pre-homosexuality as an identity so it's sort oh, of yeah, just yeah, like yeah. it's like as an action and it's sort of that fluidity so it's like even this kind of very like toxically masculine character we want to call him that is oh yeah we had our dalliances kind of it isn't quite it isn't, isn't the same space which I think is interesting also yeah. that scene is like literally a pissing contest which yeah <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like there's scenes before where the crew is like let's just get gunpowder and explode shit on the beach the thing with Jack is that he demands everyone to join into the shit and yeah. if everyone doesn't do it at the same time then it's you're being wrong for not wanting to partake in this type of masculinity when they lose the hostages <laughs> Gui John and I think Roach are exploding shit on the beach when they first run their ship aground. Oh, yeah. Like they do do this before. They do this kind of stupid shit where they just break stuff before. But it's just, it's again, it's about the structure. As soon as you demand everyone to join in and only do it this way, everyone also has to have fun this one way. Then yeah. it's not fun for everyone because everyone's not the same. Jack demanding everyone to join into this shit, breaking coconuts and on each Making other's Making a heads. turtle fight a crab, which I still find hilarious. <laughs> I don't know why, but... I still- <laughs> I just love again when people get offended by that kind of shit when they're like, you know, you've killed people. 
but this is too far. Oh, you're taking it too far. <laughs> Making a turtle fight a crab. Again, we kind of talked about the idea of middle age and sort of like how that's a kind of like a big theme within the show and identity and performance of identity. And I think that these dual ideas of retirement and death and then also rebirth as well are interlinked within the show. And so when Jeed suggests to Ed that, oh, you could try retiring and he's like, the only retirement we get is death. And I've written, our flag means retirement? Question <laughs> mark. Um, but like... <laughs> Death has several different connotations with, or like several different sort of meanings within the show. Steve's answer to everything is just to have a vacation. He's like always just like, do you want to go on a trip? It's like the first, it's like, you know, oh, we've run aground. Oh, we'll just have, you know, we'll have a holiday. And then when it's like, oh, Calico Jack, you seem a bit down. Do you want to go on a trip somewhere? Should we just like go have a bit of fun? <laughs> Basically half the show is them like doing pirate things and half of it is them just relaxing. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of the idea of the breaking away. So it's like when Steve leaves in the middle of the night trying to break away and start again. And again, we talked about this before, but the show kind of suggests that you can't just do that. You have to face that kind of older trauma. Um, which is something I want to talk about in a little bit. Jim says, like, when you kill, you die as well. You kind of got, like, Blackbeard's plan to retire by killing Steed for his identity. And then you've got Steed who kind of does that in the end when he returns to the sea, stages his own death, kind of walks away with his own kind of new identity. He's returned and... He only gets to retire in death himself because he just... He just ends yeah. up being the one to kill Yeah, him. literally. No, that's true. <laughs> Sorry, I just, yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, said and... that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm a genius. No. Uh... <laughs> But like when he leaves the first time, it's he can't just leave. If you leave this life behind, you die. It's like when he leaves, he thinks, you know, he doesn't think that Mary will report him as dead, but she does. I know it's like you can't like live in these two worlds or like you've got to sort of like, I don't know. What do you think? Like, I mean, if you don't die, you become the criminal, right? Like yeah. That's why Blackbeard wants to kill Steed and use him in his body to fake his own death. Mm -hmm. So he can actually retire or just do something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that one of the things that Izzy and Ed talk about in the beginning when he's just like, I'm so fucking bored. And then he just says like, death, I haven't done that yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Death is in actual death, but then also death is in retirement and death is in rebirth. And in the final act, you go through a kind of like a death and rebirth into his sort of like freer self, whereas Ed sort of does the opposite and kind of turns back into Blackbeard and has a reverse death, maybe. I don't know, but he's sort of like is reborn, but into this Blackbeard identity again. Um, yeah. And so you kind of, again, have those parallels. Death can mean several different things. and It's not necessarily good or, not, or necessarily bad. And like this rebirth can happen in different ways. Piracy doesn't have that kind of retirement plan, which linking that also back to the whole idea of black sales is that spanish treasure is because they all want to retire like they kind yeah. of thought they want to get that money and go away and there's the whole story about the where the name captain flint came from it's that he was just like hanging out on a ship and then a man came along and then he said his name was flint and then he like disappeared into the sea and it was like he had never existed at all and he was like that's why i chose the name because at some point i just want to flint as a character to stop existing all together and then retire into the land and then also when he it's like does he die or does he retire yeah right. it's again it's a, we don't know yeah. he's and either all, dead or he's retired at the end of the show and it's it's not clear but they're so kind of both the same thing yeah but it's sort of like black sales and our flagman's death both also do this thing of just queerness in like a domesticity way was it vance who just kept talking about it's not hard, isn't, isn't that bad not his name? It's Bane. Bane. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I keep saying it wrong. Jesus. He talks about this coffee pot or teapot on the table. Yeah, sort of being yeah. this, the worst. The domesticity, like Ed and Steve kiss when they're at the British, um, I don't know what to call it, the Navy faculty. The, I don't know what the, the, the fun scout Eric's. camp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They kiss after Ed has folded his clothes. James and Thomas also retire after they can be tender yeah. and like calm. Because the thing is, existing as a pirate means that you are, that's why Ed is so fucking bored. It's because you used to have to kill people. It's a constant dopamine rush. The yeah. challenge is gone. Are both of these shows making a point about how like love and domesticity in like, not in a, not in a heteronormative way, but just in a calm I want to take care of you because I love you type of way 
is that possible in the center but not possible outside of the center yeah and it's interesting because it's like in both those cases the moving into domesticity is becoming enfolded again within the empire yeah but like they're both the... imprisoned in both oh. of them like because they're imprisoned yeah. in the, like I, I don't know they're like the farm the farm it's like the farm. It is, it is just like the farm yeah it's essentially the yeah. farm except they're gonna have to go off and fight again so it's like not quite but it's like yeah it's essentially yeah. Kind of like being in impr- that it is imprisonment it's not the kind of same freeness that you get from piracy yeah so yeah in that way retirement is a bit like death in that it isn't like necessarily a freedom it's actually more becoming in yeah entrapped and folded into as opposed to going to china <laughs> which they're like let's go to china what's funny about china though and i'm gonna link the tiktok video because i don't remember the name of the pirate but there was a chinese female pirate she actually got to retire in a way because she just very smart like to chill at some point as well (laughs) and like actually got to retire in some i'm gonna link the video because i don't want to like misquote what actually happened she's one of those people that's always named as actually the most successful pirate in history but no one remembers including me remembers her name because we always talk about blackbeard we talk about jerte becca retirement is this impossibility in a way for them Mm. creates enough safety and not just also enough calmness for yeah. ed to sit down and go like what makes me happy it's you mm. like yeah. on the ship do they ever have time to just chill for five seconds without izzy barging in and demanding something we could link this if we wanted because the love makes them vulnerable to vulnerability oh yeah oh you've <laughs> done oh, it yeah. you've done it we did God. it we did it <laughs> yay <laughs> When I first watched the show, I had absolutely like the steed reaction to Izzy. I just kept thinking, fuck off. <laughs> Izzy has a point. The love of Eddie. Uh, Eddie. She's not calling me Eddie. <laughs> you know, me and my bro, Eddie. Um, Blackbeard <laughs> becoming Ed and Ed falling for steed does make him vulnerable. That's- it is a danger in piracy, but also not in their kind of piracy as well. If you are only giving a shit about yourself and to, mm. about your crew to a certain extent, you are a lot more protected than if you're trying to f- make sure that no one else gets killed. Mm. I mean, that's why Ed has to like sign the act of grace in the first place. It's because they want to kill steed. It's not really for himself. Yeah. in that moment so much because i watched that one clip that one really well written scene from black sales again mm-hmm. where silver talks about because captain flint talks about how in the darkness there be dragons and then silver talks about him falling in love has actually allowed him to see the possibility of a future and again mm-hmm. the idea of domesticity and not just living day by day at how not to die actually planning for a future with someone else yeah and it has the same thing it's just the dopamine is gone so he is now bored but in a really good way he's content yeah like steed allows uh, some sort of like content to be part of his life yeah i just think that's really beautiful <laughs> it would just be living like beyond like a life of fear and a threat of death where there would at least be the possibility yeah i'm i just want to see what happens in season two now in in history they both died in like 1718 and the show is set in 1717 yeah and it's like oh no <laughs> oh no no, they're just going to retire. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I was going to think that they're dead. That's what I and was. Yeah. yeah. Flip side of death is rebirth and retirement. So, yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, they've said, again, they've said it with the title, like, our flag means death. It's like, death must be a central theme within the show, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean like a final ending. It can be, it's like with like tarot cards, it's like the death card doesn't just mean like literal death. Sorry to bring yes. in tarot. I don't really know that much about tarot, but like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it is kind of like a rebirth or like a beginning. That's what kind of death yeah. can mean as well. Yeah. Our flag means retirement. Our flag <laughs> means retirement. <laughs> We're all just tired. <laughs> retired. <man>. Retired. <laughs> uh, I hadn't even thought about like, yeah, I'm going to retire. Well, was I tired to begin with? <laughs> I just think that the reason why I do think that vulnerability is so important in the show because that's the whole thing with the Kraken like um, it created the story about him sort of seeing this monstrous thing even as a child not being afraid of it in a way and then in the end it turns out that no this is like the monster that he's created and the only person he lets in on that in terms of vulnerability is steed in the Gittleman article again steed is a living example that there is another way to survive which I would argue against them dying in 1718. Yeah. <laughs> but- <laughs> uh... 
a lot of the vulnerability that I think Ed has to have towards Steed that Steed has towards Ed a lot more mm -hmm. from the beginning is possible because Steed has money yes like, tied to English empire and all that shit and like all the violence because in real life Steed Bonnet had a plantation with slaves they very much don't even link to that in the show mm. they very openly say we don't give a shit about the historical accuracy and stuff that's why Steed can do so many things when he and Marius make the plan in the end to fake his death she gets all the money but whose money yeah. is that whose money yeah like that's not he's like money. a landowner and it's yeah. like yeah that's someone else's land. Fuck off. Why the fuck are you in Barbados in the first place? Blackbeard is a character exists because Ed needs to protect himself in a way that Steed doesn't. Mm -hmm. Because he has something to fall back on. He can go home again. <laughs> Where's Ed gonna go? Yeah, like, I, and I think it kind of links to the concept of work as well. It's Blackbeard and Ed's identity as Blackbeard. He needs that work in order to survive outside of the norm. And like in order to like have any sort of power in, in this kind of context of empire. And whereas like Steed doesn't need to work, if Ed retires from being Blackbeard, then he's vulnerable to all of these things again, to racism, class and like all these things. And so like he, like, another reason why he's so like tied to this identity is because it's very difficult to retire from that because he doesn't really have a space outside of that. Whereas Steed does because he's this like white landowner and can like create that space in a way. This land within the show quite well of them getting more and more vulnerable with each other because it happens in so much violence usually around them yeah. that you just don't notice it. He opens himself up to Steed as saying that he's the Kraken when they do the fuckery. <laughs> you don't realize that that's them like getting closer with each other because five minutes ago, Ed was thinking about still like stabbing Steve behind the curtain. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just thinking about this because you said class. Remember when Ed yells at one of the soldiers, do you have any idea how fucking rich I am? It's again, this idea of traditional money versus newly yeah. rich. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ed is not rich in a way that is ever going to be respectable. Yeah. And Steed is just, you know, you inherit wealth. You don't like acquire it. In a weird way, Ed has acquired it. <laughs> Because Steed is also like, he's like, oh, I gave like everyone like a wage that I, I, I pay them with a wage so that like they don't have to worry, be so stressed about robbing ships all the time. And it's like, that's, <laughs> it's like, that's not how it works because it's like the wealth literally comes from like the steel. Because then it is just like you're doing this for fun rather than like doing it because you're doing it in order to survive kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But also the reason they get to be vulnerable with each other is because they're both actually just huge dorks. Everyone around them is. I think Black Pete literally says, what the fuck is happening right now when they both come out and they have each other's clothes on? <laughs> like, they just both find such dorky things so lovely and that that's how they bond. It's yeah. also how Frenchie and we, John, bond is because they clan. Oh, I the know. It's so beautiful. And their room. Yeah, the sitting nook where we just sit like, yeah. Um, okay. When they're describing Blackbeard towards the beginning, it's like, killing is like breathing for him and then yeah. later it's like um falling in love is like breathing uh, mary says that yeah and it's that progression from it's instinctual like human part of existing right yeah like it's not something you put on it's not a performance it's just you someone that gets quoted quite a lot in theology is thomas martin and there's this famous quote from him uh, love is our true destiny we do not find the meaning of life by ourselves alone we find it with another you have this vulnerability between these two people about them becoming like versions of each other hmm. and teaching each other things about themselves and them growing together it, you've written like ed trying to become a version of steed he snaps because it doesn't work for him because i don't quite agree with i don't necessarily i don't completely disagree but i think I think he does go into too much of a sort of like um, spiral into trying to like become Steed perhaps. But also if Izzy hadn't been there to kind of push him back into the kind of destructive coping mechanisms of being Blackbeard, I feel like he could have found a way to heal through that because he's like, you know, we're going to start a talent show. He's actually feeling okay. He's, and there's that bit where I think Izzy's just spoken to him and here's the crew being like, oh, we're going to do the talent show and, and start like kind of chanting Edward. And it's sort of like, could have gone two ways. It could, like He could have gone with like, I'm going to heal with the crew or I'm going to turn back into Blackbeard and go with this sort of more destructive coping mechanism. He could have maybe found a way through it that was slightly more healthy, quote unquote healthy, could have gone the other way, but there was like a crossroads there. Yeah, I don't... because he does the thing that Steed wants to do in the beginning of they talk it through. Ed wants them to express themselves creatively because he tries to express his grief creatively. And I do agree with you, without Izzy there, this would have gone a lot better. 
I do think he's like, okay, if he is not going to be with me, then I'm just going to replace him by myself in a weird way. Mm, yeah. And it just doesn't work mm, Yeah, when he tries to create this, express himself. And when he like, calls for Lucius to write all this down, he talks about how if I let go, all will fall. If he too, like, let's go. Because that dude just needs to fucking cry, which still ends up happening. He pretends that he's talking about someone else, someone entirely Highly fictional. fictional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder if this was him trying to make Ed into fiction again so he could become Blackbeard again. How much of that was Izzy? How much of it was him just trying to, again, uh, separate these two characters? It's interesting. But, yeah. Yeah. Because it's like, like, again, it's like art and truth and like performance and truth. And it's like, in this case, it's like kind of turning the quote unquote truth into like the fiction, the fictional and sort of like as like a distancing mechanism. Lucius, what if life just begins again and essentially signs his own death warrant because yeah. life to begin again. It's just a lot easier to give in to the anger than it is mm. to try mm. to deal with it. <laughs> I'm not judging Blackbeard here. I very much understand that. It's a lot easier to be angry than it is to just get over someone, deal with what that's done to you. Yeah. And hopefully grow from it or whatever but what if life begins again I feel like also connects again to this thing we were talking about do you have to like kill yourself in this life to sort of become someone else over there or can those things coexist I want to now move into talking about revenge and trauma because I think that segues quite nicely. Yeah. That's okay. So kind of the concept of revenge is quite interesting because first of all, like the ship is named revenge. It's called the revenge and, and kind of how that works within the narrative, I think is quite interesting. It's like, why would you choose that as the name of your ship apart from that it sounds kind of cool or kind of scary or whatever. But I've also been thinking of like kind of the genre of revenge and like the revenge tragedy, like with Hamlet, like we have with episode five. And you also kind of have this idea of being haunted by the past and like with Buttons continually bringing up the idea of ghosts, the island is haunted, thinking Lucius is a demon, um, supernatural <laughs> world. <laughs> it's like, why did you bite me? <laughs> like, you were a demon. Also, like, the cats are like haunting stuff. Yeah, yeah, as well. Oh, that cat. And the cat does haunt them because the flag like mm-hmm. brings the British back. And it's also the twin is kind of like a ghost from the past as well. Oh, because it's yeah. him yeah. coming back. Yeah. Wow. The worst wow. kind of twin. The worst a British <laughs> colonial soldier in this yeah. two of them. <laughs> yeah. But like personal demons rather than like actual supernatural beings. Except you also kind of get those psychological hauntings as well. Buttons is like revenging Carl by like hexing Calico yes. Jack. <laughs> And then it ends up being a British canon, but still. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, I hex thee. Yeah. <laughs> And it's, I guess you could read that moment as like either a supernatural moment or just like luck or whatever, but it, it works very nicely. It's very well done. Yeah. But so you have like Steed and his trauma and um, he's haunted by, you know, him accidentally killing the badminton twin, leaving his wife and children and also his childhood trauma, um, like from his father as well. And then you also have Blackbeard and his trauma with the Kraken um, and you have like Jim and their family and the signification of the orange, which I think is quite interesting. Because it kind of like, again, a bit like with sort of death, like having like several different significations, a bit like the moon, you kind of have like this orange that can mean several different things. Like, I mean, it starts off with just like kind of like cake and scurvy and sort of like as like a kind of like object of food. I don't know, like a just like, like a, a basic need. <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. just like a kind of a basic object. And then it becomes kind of the symbol of like generational trauma. Jim's family, it's like their father was killed because these people were stealing these oranges. And then you find this petrified orange in the ground and it's sort of that symbol of the trauma that's sort of not gone away. It stays with them. And Jim has to go back to that place of trauma to kind of pick it up and find it. And it hasn't gone away. But what they can do is they can let it go and re-signify it. And it then becomes this image of treasure and, and it becomes something that Steve can then give to his daughter to kind of form a, a new family connection. And so it's the trauma doesn't go away, but you can re-signify it and like go back to it and work through it. And it's that's kind of like a theme throughout the thing as well. Again, with Steed returning to his family, which I think is quite interesting. Spanish Jackie literally tells Jim, let go. Like, there's yeah. no, you don't want to be like me. Jim says like, what are you doing with my family tree? Or yeah. like, with my family's tree? Also, it's just families in general where a lot of trauma comes from. <laughs> Although trying to like rectify a lot of that stuff for Jim, yeah. like talking to them about it, right? Yeah, yeah. you took it through as a crew. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and I think like a lot of the characters kind of go through that arc of again linking back to vulnerability, like 
kind of talking through their issues but like kind of having actually built up like kind of solid relationships and it's sort of like coming from a place of trust and a place of equality I guess as well maybe Buttons is the most emotionally healthy person on that ship yeah (laughs) that's like a really healthy relationship with Carl yeah just bathing in moonlight yeah and like you put down as well like is the one to kind of talk to Olu when Jim leaves kind of helping Olu with grief even though like Jim's not dead but then it's like also becomes later on in the episode the one who is actually grieving for Carl you're like do you deserve it Carl and he's really good at defending against demons you know so good so that's also so really good. helpful when you're um on a boat on a boat yeah at sea isn't he also the one that tells Steve that everyone wants to kill him yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> I feel like he just doesn't seem to have a whole lot of, I mean, just vengeance or ill like feeling towards most people. He's like chaotic neutral, I feel. Yeah. Like we were gonna, yeah. yeah. Probably, yes, yes, he is. Quite because, neutral. Yeah, because he's just annoyed the Calico Jack interrupted his sunbathing, but he just also <laughs> just doesn't, the only emotion you get out of him is just because he hates Calico Jack for killing Carl. More than fucking fair. Yeah. The rest of it is just, yeah, chaotic neutral. <laughs> And I think the lyric in Perfect Day, you're going to reap just what you sow. And it's like kind of facing the consequences. and But also like facing like the consequences of things that have happened before and sort of having to deal with, again with like family trauma or like the image of the tree or like the image of something that's buried and then like must be re- unburied. Orange isn't going to like bear any fruit. Like nothing's going to grow from that, but you've still got to deal with it anyway. And it does sort of become like a seed between Steed and his daughter in a weird way. Yeah. yeah. Like something yeah. they can share. The lyrics from Perfect Day, but because it, it is interesting that it goes to you're going to reap just what you sow because the one I don't know if it's actually in the show but it's it's just the it's such a perfect day I'm glad I spent it with you it's just such like a that's like the chorus of the song yeah and it is like a kind of okay there we go and it's over and now we're going to retire and you're going to reap just what you sow so So, but then that isn't like necessarily a bad thing that you're going to reap what you sow like Mm. it's also what we've sown is that we've had like a a a nice day together it's also (laughs) usually i think meant in such a negative way you're gonna reap what you sow yeah i always hear that like i I, I do feel nice seeds you're gonna get some nice you're gonna get a nice garden you get some nice oranges you pick a nice orange glaze for your cake and not get scurvy and it's going to be a lovely time yeah Mm-hmm. Also within the in the avalanche salary.coin, that's also the food metaphor of the crumbs of love would, that you offer me with they're the crumbs that I've left behind. Yeah. It's just sort of like what do you you're gonna reap what you sow again. It's sort of like it's not just it's like a give and take, you know? Yeah. Like it doesn't just go one way. So it's just the the check of scan of actions in life, like the yeah. of, like repercussions when you do something. <laughs> final section that I have here is found family and just talking about characters alternative forms of family and things again one of the reasons why piracy is just such a good genre for queer stories is because you have this found family I mean you guess you sort of also have this in the love like workplace comedies <laughs> when I rewatched the show the steeds lines sound like a white savior teacher in like drama about a tough school district because he says a lot of the guys are sweethearts deep down They've experienced a fair amount of trauma. And then when they start yelling at each other or start attacking each other when they're sewing, he says, what you could have done? And then he said, like, talked about it. And he's like, no, you could have shared shared. it. (laughs) But I think think what doesn't work about it to start off with is Steve's like acting like he's this authority on dealing with trauma. And it's like, no, you're not Steve, not at all. (laughs) And so it's kind of working through it. And it it becomes like you can work it through as a crew because it becomes you've built that trust and you've also stopped being oh I, I kind of know everything and I can do this and it's my personal headcanon that next season Steve will not become the captain and that his character group will be becoming part of the crew because it's no I am a very mediocre pirate I don't really deserve to be in this position of power and I also don't have any wealth anymore and that's kind of the only thing that was keeping me there mm. in the first place so I think I, that's kind of how what I hope will happen maybe he'll become just like a better pirate and a better captain but I think it might just be that he becomes part of the crew and that's okay. And that's sort of his growth. I don't know. That's kind of what I'm hoping will happen. And I felt like that doesn't make any sense because Steed is kind of useless in most ways on the ship when they talk about how they want to kill him maybe later. Olo is the one that says, we're also a pretty shitty crew. Like, such a, yeah. he's a shitty captain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there are just so many shots throughout the show of just someone in the background just nailing something. But like Lucius just like randomly just like pushing Whack a it. hammer down for no reason. Uh, yeah, just like nothing. banging on like a banister. 
dress that's just like broken it's like there's nothing like what are you trying to achieve <laughs> It does make sense for them to all just be a crew. I feel like also when uh, Steed buys the map, Lucius is the one that says he paid more money for it than he's ever seen in his entire life. I was like, why not just, I mean, this is so communist, why not just share it? Yeah. <laughs> you could have shared it. You could have yeah. listened to your yeah. own fucking no, instead lesson. he decided to do wages. He was like, I, I'm, I will going to be like the, uh, the, the, the factory um, owner. Boss, I will the factory be the owner boss. and I yeah. will pay you a wage. You will be estranged from your pirate labor. Um, <laughs> I just in terms of found family I thought it was kind of cute that um, Steed in his fever dreams talks about Mary quite a lot but his first thing he asks when he wakes up is the crew yeah that is yeah. a really nice moment because especially as it's like you kind of see Steed as quite a self-centered character but like his first thought when he wakes up after being stabbed is oh is the crew okay yeah yeah and also he does set out not only for Ed but he does want to find his crew and he does find his crew in the end that's where yeah. he returns to yeah and Oh, I do find it funny that the reason they start respecting him is because he gets stabbed. <laughs> like, he gets stabbed quite a lot. I feel like yeah, Ed, Ed gets stabbed, uh, Steve gets stabbed twice for no reason, and then also gets almost shot by the British. <laughs> yeah. It's like when, again, the badminton twins, like, how come you keep getting out of this unscathed? And it's like, I'm pretty sure he's been stabbed like twice. Like, he got strangled <laughs> that one time. He's been stabbed oh, a yeah. few times. Like, I don't think he's completely, like, he did nearly die, like, quite a lot also like the emotional <laughs> trauma like he's also dealing you know there's hmm, i'm not sure he get, got out of it quite unscathed but yeah. yeah yeah i mean i don't think badminton's brother is i think the moral author or the authority on if <laughs> yeah, anyone I has any trauma perhaps i'm we... fine i'm just trying to stab you but like just i'm fine yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is how you deal with your problems you go and yes. like shoot someone you stab them yeah yeah uh... They all have the flags flying together because they all get to contribute something to their brand. (laughs) And they end the pilot episode uh, crying to Pinocchio, them like um, just sleeping on deck. This one of roach hugging onions. Yeah. Like of onions, which I think is beautiful. I did worry, like when they do like the thing where they like jump up, like Roach tries to jump over the side of the ship and then just like breaks his ribs on the side of the ship. I was like, is he okay? And they just don't address it, which I'm like, okay, I get it. It's a comedy show, like you just don't address it. But I was like, is he okay though? Like, Toxic masculinity will okay. break your ribs. Yeah, it's just like, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, I just think that they're just so lovely together. They could have made it so much more preachy in that sense, but it just works. And I think also what bonds them together, for example, is just their hatred of Izzy. I yeah. feel like Izzy sort of a reminder for them that Steed was kind of okay as captain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when Izzy gets defeated, I remember uh, like Roach actually makes him a sandwich. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then throws it at his head. <laughs> it's just such a random moment. It's so good. <laughs> Just like Roach just going like not for nothing, but that guy really is a dick, huh? <laughs> it's just so funny. Yeah, and is he such a bad captain? Because they're just like, no, I'm not going to put up with this shit. Also, like, you're not... Because it's like, they will kind of put up with it with Blackbeard, I think, because they don't ever, like, try and mutiny him, but they won't put up with it with Izzy, because it's like, you don't have the name, and also you're just a dick, so, like... Because he's yeah. cool. Yeah. Actually, that would defeat Lucia's argument and our argument that uh, theatricality is all of it, because... Izzy and everyone on Ed's ship is like essentially just like a leather daddy like they all just wear the gayest most leathery outfits you've ever seen like most of it is in the background but like but like Izzy does have the same like a similar leather outfit but it doesn't make him cool and it doesn't make anyone respect him no yeah He's kind of like if the deputy head teacher tries to like, <laughs> gain power and you're like, you're not the real boss. You're just like the one a bit lower but on the ladder. Like... Again, I feel like Izzy could have been so easily just like a really basic character that's just annoying and you're like, why is he there? But Con O'Neill is having such a good time displaying the straight man who's the only person who's just acknowledging like, what is happening? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Ed? What happened to my boss? What's going on? Just Con O'Neill as an actress, just having the time of his life, just with all the fan attention. <laughs> He's getting... Someone caught together like every moment in television and film moments when Con O'Neill kissed a man and then Con O'Neill just commented below the two, he just slut. <laughs> <laughs> They do just call Jim them in a period show of all things. Like they misgender people in today's newspaper. Yeah, <laughs> but like... I know. I was really because I wasn't expect. That wasn't something I knew about the show, so I was just like, oh wow. Like yes, yeah. This yeah. is a part of the show. Okay, and it's like 
when they go back to like their nana and like she's just like oh yeah like just kind of instantly is like oh yeah I'm just gonna refer to you in this way and come on like, in Jim yeah, come on in Jim <laughs> the first time I noticed the crew re- referring to Jim as them was because they talk about how who should be the leader of the crew who should be the new captain and then um someone I think Frenchie is the one that says if Jim stabbed me I think I would probably deserve it and then yeah. we John goes like I would I would love to be stabbed by Jim like yeah and then Black Pete is like they just started talking like why are you all respecting them so much the context of it isn't like being like a sit down and talking about these are the pronouns we're not gonna use that just doesn't happen the Swedish guy I don't remember what his name was on the show if you're no longer Jim can I be be Jim Jim. (laughs) again performativity (laughs) oh in the scene where you because Jim is not on the poster because I guess you would maybe in a poster when you look too closely like maybe clock the nose when Jim puts down their nose in the pilot episode it's like the moment in the lyrics when the song goes goodness knows (laughs) 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 the dot it was so funny when I rewatched it (laughs) Oh, that's good. No nose joke. <laughs> also, I saw, I, I think I saw this in like a tweet or something, but someone like, online was like, it's like a good thing that Lucius found Jim's nose and stuff, like kind of their clothes and stuff on the rock. Because if anyone else had found it, like they'd have just been like, oh, Jim's turned into a rock. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the reference to everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I would have loved for um, their nose to end up in the nose collection. In the, the nose jar. I want to see it in the nose jar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah, when Spanish Jack is pulling off their nose and it's <laughs> like, oh my God. Ah, what are you doing? What are you doing? Ah. <laughs> Also, I just love the fact that Steed screamed so much louder when Steed was so much shocked that Jim can't talk. Yeah. And the fact that Jim was like wearing a fake beard and a fake nose. <laughs> but I did find it really funny when Frenchie was the reason why women and cats are not allowed on the ship is because they're like mythical creatures and they're like mean and stuff. And I was like, I think you just have an issue with people you don't get to tell what to do, buddy. Like, yeah. <laughs> I think there's drama that's created around things that aren't male and aren't labeled as reasonable as a result of that. That has nothing to do <laughs> with the actuality of anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was also just thinking about like Jim as in terms of Shakespeare and kind of cross dressing characters and Ooh. sort of like stuff like that. Yeah. And then also kind of historical pirates like um, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed and sort of like, yes, yes, yes. sort of like how doing a, a reading of that as well, which I hadn't thought about before. And I was like, oh yeah, Jim kind of fits into that like his history of piracy in that sense as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Also, did we talk about this, like the historical accuracy or like lack of thereof of like what actually happened on the show? When Izzy first encounters them, he says, like, what kind of idiot runs the ship aground and the thing is that both blackbeard and izzy ran the ships aground historically like twice yeah and the way that they did it apparently was that blackbeard ran his ship aground and then izzy was on the second ship that they tried to like pull him away and then ran <laughs> ship aground in the process of trying to do that hey. so which kind of idiot you're kind of idiot <laughs> yeah I feel like that must be quite a common sort of thing to happen I don't know I've literally no idea but like you know it can't be that difficult if you're like at sea most of the time and you don't necessarily know all of the waters that you're sailing through mm-hmm. it's not necessarily that you wash up on a beach but you might just kind of like if it's like a very like shallow sort of cove that you're like sailing through I, I don't know I think that most pirates I mean I was thinking like they probably drank a lot as well so maybe this did happen quite a lot but the reason Steed runs the ship at ground is because no one is steering it yeah (laughs) because they're just very (laughs) mediocre pirates as we know I just I want to talk about this for a second because I do find this unbelievably frustrating when I've rewatched it but Black Pete as a character it's so sad that he's so impressed by Blackbeard and no one ever respects him for it. He tries so hard to be yeah. adventurous and take charge and everything and no one ever wants him to, including Lucius. <laughs> <laughs> when they get attacked by Izzy, when they try to steal back Izzy Hand's hostages, their own hostages, 
Black Pete swings from a vine and lands on Fang, the one that Lucius draws later. In the scene, no one's moving. Black Pete's, he's still on the vine and his legs are just around Fang. And it just, it looks so much like a pirate show, <laughs> but it's so <laughs> useless because he just doesn't have any like strength yeah. in that moment and it's just so funny to me but then that scene is all about theatricality as well because they're like oh the, the forest is haunted also we're surrounded also like yeah. it's all about yeah. making an image of to make them hand over a hostage and so it's about creating that image of piracy in that scene yeah but like yeah. rewatching so it I just skill. felt bad for him i was like no one respects you and you're trying so hard <laughs> So the reason we're talking about our flagman's death is one, because we're very honored that Lucy wants to talk to us again about another show. Also, we still need to talk about Mamma Mia at some point with Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Lily James Cinematic Universe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The reason why we didn't do another Black Sus episode <laughs> is because I didn't think that Taika Waititi and uh, some white straight cis guy were going to make a really good pirate show. No one warned me. So the show started airing on March 3rd of this year. Vaguely read about it on social media and I thought about it in terms of our podcast, but that's also the reason why I watched a really bad Blackbeard movie last week that was just in the library. Oh no. Um, it's like I'll like, watch anything yeah. with pirates in it. I feel like pirate media is either like the best thing ever or the worst thing ever. It's like, <laughs> it's the same thing with like Muppet Treasure Island that was just like, I'm sorry to anyone who like that was your childhood, I apologize, but it's again maybe a bit like Merlin it's not good to come back to as an adult and just like try and watch that it does not it does not if you don't have the nostalgia factor it's very difficult to to get into it's like, was so not good. Bored. <laughs> you were like 20 minutes like this is not a good movie let's but watch again, I hate about you they should make a Muppet Black Sails I would mm. watch that. I thought about maybe watching our flag means death in terms of our podcast. It didn't really spark my interest so much because that kind of comedy is usually very hit or miss for me. Then I saw Taika Waititi posted something about the second to last episode. Yeah. That's when they kiss, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he was like, we made a romance, not a bromance. And then he also wrote hashtag love is love. And let's please ban that phrase from straight people using it. Because if I see that in a fucking other poster, I'm going <laughs> to scream. And then again, <laughs> randomly, Katie Soros on TikTok mentioned that they have a non-binary character that's canonically non-binary on the show. And I was like, what? Really? And then I started watching it and got really into it. And then... By the end, I was sobbing because every time something queer happened, I just didn't kind of believe it because I just assumed at some point someone was going to pull out the rug from under me and just didn't happen. It just kept getting gayer. <laughs> and everyone like analyzing it and like talking about all the different aspects like we've mentioned now, I don't know, maybe 30% of all the analytics that you could like maybe go into the show and like from like an autistic stand, all the characters you could read as autistic, all the characters you could read as neurodivergent, all the fandom content just turned into queer content in, about the show. The show, like all the queer fandom usually just gets taken for granted so much. And all the actors are just so into it. Samba Shoot, the actor who plays Roach, the cook, posted a orange cake recipe. <laughs> and <laughs> like over 400 people so far have made it and tagged him in it. Like, yeah, I've just... noticed like, because I started following his Instagram and he's like always posting these cakes as well. Like, <laughs> it's really nice and like constantly reposting like fan content. It's really sweet. Mind you, that's a cake that doesn't even show up in the show. They just talk about the fact that they <laughs> use they... all the Isn't oranges. Isn't that a title card? I swear the cakes are, t or it's like, I swear that you see the cake, maybe. If I you feel see like... it, it's not a title card. Oh, you I think see you see okay. an orange, okay. maybe. Like when you scroll down and look at the title. Maybe I'm just oh, thinking yeah, of an orange. Okay, maybe yeah. I'm just thinking of like fan made cakes then, and I'm just like, no, <laughs> but it definitely happened in the show, and now it's becoming pre read text, and it's like kind of like a backwards, a post read text. I don't know, and it's like, Ooh. whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> the post read text. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, coming next week is an episode of Liliana's post. <laughs> <laughs> the a yeah. The yeah, alternative yeah. universe version of this <laughs> podcast. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. But there's just so many fans who like read like Roach and Frenchie is like aromantic or asexual. And like the actors just all like reposting all of this without ever being like, don't apply this queerness to things we don't know. Like it's not fact yet. And like no one gives a shit. Everyone, including the showrunners, just having the time of their life, just 
being so happy having this queer fan base which you should fucking be they do like free marketing for you yeah I mean, that's the reason I started watching it and then I talked to Lily about watching it it was a number one of breakout shows in America for seven weeks straight and then it got dethroned by Moon Knight the new Disney Plus show and then it went back to number one I think like also like Jenkins has talked about the fact that he didn't even know about queer baiting as like a huge issue or something <laughs> Like he, he didn't even think about that aspect of it. He just didn't know. And he was really overwhelmed with the amount of attention he got, especially from like a queer fandom for the show. And I just think that that's really beautiful <laughs> that we finally got a show that was not subtext, but text. And yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become the revenge, the vengeance of all time if he does kill. Yeah, that will them. be some revenge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just me, like, writing a strongly worded email. <laughs> <laughs> as of yet, as of recording, they have not re renewed the show. But, like, when I first saw this list and, like, Pachinko was on there, and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I love Pachinko. It's one of the best shows I maybe have ever seen. I do not remember anyone talking about Pachinko in, like, fandom spaces or, like, yeah. on my TikTok or anything. Yeah, I think sometimes you have those things that people don't really talk about but are just kind of quietly watching. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but like they don't really inspire the same amount of like I don't know like fandom content so it seems like they're smaller um, you mean there are people they, out it's there less of a vocal audience <laughs> you mean there are people who are not like me just annoyingly screaming about everything that they watch and just demanding other people watch them as well but just watch stuff and they're happy with that <laughs> couldn't be me <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so should we move on to recommendations? And as our guest, Lucy, would you like to start with your recommendation for our audience? Okay, my recommendation is I'm going to filter through everything that's in my brain. Okay, I'm, I'm going to recommend something that I think both of you have now watched recently because of me. And that is the film Pender's Fen. It's bonkers <laughs> and you have to watch it. And that's all I'm going to say on the matter. I think you should give like a tiny bit of context because I feel like also the, just the name Pender's Fen I was like what does that even mean and it's like we, when you we're gonna put it in writing but... because I would have never known how to spell that yeah I, oh, I thought okay. it was like Pendler's Fen and I was like Pender's what, Fen like, okay so these it's like words. A, it's a play it was part of the play for today series which was released on the BBC in the 1970s going into it you have to imagine that you're a family living in the 1970s and that this is the only thing available to watch on the BBC at this time <laughs> at like nine o'clock on a Sunday that's really <laughs> funny it's so it's a film um it's kind of about I don't know I don't know what it's about and that's what I like about it but it's a lot about the British countryside yeah it's like um, you don't want to give any spoilers so you're like, space, yeah, there yeah I, I don't like telling either. anyone anything about it I'm like just yeah. watch it um Yes. It's not a comedy, so I thought it was a comedy. So don't it's go in there with that comedy. expectation. <laughs> there it's are not. bits that are funny. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, like, unintentionally. it's funny. But no, <laughs> yeah. It can be funny, but it's not. It's not yes. definitely not a comedy. Have fun. Thank you. Very good recommendation. I would like to say that it scarred me to an inch of my life <laughs> in a way that I did not expect. And that despite the fact that I am a coward and everything scares me, you should still watch it. Yeah. I feel like saying there are elements of horror in it is fair and also not okay, too much. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to give too many spoilers, but I was not, ex I was, I was, I, I want to say that there's that elements of horror, but if that puts you off, please don't, that, that shouldn't put you off. Yeah, no, I shouldn't. could deal with I it. Can, I Anna can, I can get through it. it and yeah. I hate horror films. So. Same, yeah, we all do. Same. And we still really liked it. So yeah. <laughs> we all got through it. <laughs> yeah. And it's set in Worcester and that's all, Worcestershire. Um, yes because I'm like I live near there and I was like hey it's what's the shame um <laughs> I'm kind of terrified now that you and I have the same recommendation so I tried to look for like another one. Oh, I think I know what you're gonna I think I didn't go for that because I, I think I know what you mean and I didn't go for it because I was like Anna's gonna go for that so mine's like slightly random and it's just a bit strange but um, so again a movie that's been on my recommended list for a long time because people just randomly just mentioned it on Twitter and I'm the same as Lucy in that I both like to tell people just watch something because I don't want to tell you because I don't want to ruin it for you because I just want you to like well like whatever this media becomes in your brain 
it's sort of worth it to me for you to for me not to tell you anything about it so you, you can like develop your own thoughts on it but I watched finally everything everywhere all at once and it is it was weirdly enough one of those because I watch a lot of movies it was one of those things where I just sat there and just was quiet and just thought holy shit what just happened to me like I wish I would have seen it in cinema and I didn't and I still want to see it in cinema because it's just I just there are so many elements of this movie that will never be something that I personally understand because I am a white person who's never immigrated anywhere but it's one of those things that I just everything I dislike about that type of film because I went into it thinking like oh this is going to be sci-fi sort of like with like a nod to Marvel or whatever and just everything I dislike about that kind of genre just wasn't there and it was everything everywhere <laughs> <laughs> but like it was just it's such a good film and that's really... again I don't want to say anything because I'm like <gasps> but like yeah <laughs> it's just very good and I just sat there and I was like, have I discovered the meaning of life? <laughs> have they just taught me like this was this was like as close to a religious experience that I've had with like watching movie that I can sort of remember. It's it's wild. What a fucking movie. And yeah, everyone needs to watch this movie. Please watch it. It's got Misha Yo in it. And um yeah. <laughs> and she's just so good. And she needs to like be given more stuff like this like just very good stuff <laughs> yeah yeah what a weird way of putting that but like yeah watch that movie it's really good it's really good yeah so my recommendation I kind of feel like because yeah I've watched both both of those are things that I've watched recently and I haven't watched that much else <laughs> so I was like yes okay I'm gonna struggle a little bit with this one so but one thing that I have been enjoying recently and this is like you've both given like very sort of like highbrow films that are like very good and like you know real great and I'm like, I'm going to um, recommend the first two Mika albums that he brought out in 2007 and 2009, because that's just what I've been really enjoying recently, since Eurovision. And Mika did his amazing set, um, his like medley. And I was just like, oh, yes, I like these songs. And then went back and actually listened to his full like first two albums. And I'm just getting to the stage where I've slightly overplayed them and I need to stop <laughs> and listen to something else. But like since I like finished all my deadlines like a week and a bit ago, I've just been basically had those albums on repeat just like every day. Um, and been very much enjoying them just partying like it was 2007 um so if you just they're just they're just poppy and just like fun and I'm just like I'm just smiling and happy and I don't have to think too hard and that's nice um so yeah I'd recommend those as your relief from like your very highbrow movies that you watch these highbrow films and you're like I need to like think about nothing for a little bit and then I'll come back to them just listen to a bit of Mika have fun so I would argue that both Pandas, Fen and Everything Everywhere All At Once can be watched on like a service level yeah. yeah and then you can just have it sit with you and then you will like yeah I think that's true I'm like saying highbrow but like I know what yeah, you're sort of like very you, you can still very much like consume them they're very like you can still watch them and like really enjoy them and I'm like I don't think I like understood everything about either of those films but I still really enjoyed them and I like, could rewatch them but they're not like made in a sort of like um no up itself kind of way like it's not like completely impenetrable either of those films like they're very enjoyable yeah. um but yeah yeah I mean I haven't seen everywhere all at once but I can say Pendus but it feels watchable like yeah it kind of as it you're not like oh god there's more like it goes so fast <laughs> I think yeah it's like yeah an hour and a half and then it's over and then you're yeah. like well I'm gonna be thinking about that for the rest of my life yeah <laughs> I'm so glad England is fictional <laughs> Sorry, that's that's gonna be my favorite jokes for the rest of my life. If you want to keep up with the podcast, um, you can find us on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter um, at Liliana Pod. So that's L I L I A W N A P O D. Or um, on Tumblr, we are Liliana's Pre Red Media Tech. Um, and then you can also email us um, at Liliana's period media tech at hotmail.com. And I think that's all of them. I think we've, we've covered all bases there. You can comment, you can tell us stuff, you yes. can obviously share our episodes, you can also just disagree with us. I, I happily engage with anybody's like opinion on media all the time. So please tell me, please tell me what I got wrong. Yeah, I don't. I, everything I say is correct and you cannot disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, do not come for our guests. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Now we can now we can move on to joke. Um, Lucy, do you have a joke for us today? 
yes as our guest we've been we've been looking forward to this the entire episode so this is going to be the pinnacle this is, this is the pinnacle go for it <clears throat> what is a pirate's favorite part of a song i don't know lucy what is the a pirate's favorite part of a song it's the hook <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's not Thank a repeat you. of when we had last time. Hooray! <laughs> oh, tension over. Oh, what a relief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>